My name is Thorsten Overgaard. I'm a Danish photographer. I travel the world taking photographs and teaching photography. Today I will touch on a question like a M or like a... Before we get into it, below the video there is a free ebook you can download. You simply put in your email and then you get the book by email a few minutes later. And that's a book I wrote about some of the iconic photographs through history and the people who took them. And I also write about how I photograph and why I photograph. And as a bonus there's also free uh, presets and styles for Lightroom and Capture One. That is the ones, uh, the presets and styles that I use every day to make black and white and color photos in almost one click. Normally they are $48, today you just have to put in the code and they are free. The big question today is, uh, is it like a M or is it like a SL? And you could say, uh, some have answered that question the same way that I have, which is I have both, so I don't have to choose. But if I had to choose, then what would I pick? If we go back in history, 100 years, then uh, came the traditional camera, the Leica M. Um, and the idea with this camera, you could say there's a lot of ideas that was new when this camera was made in 1925. And one of them is that it's what's called full frame. So today when we talk about full frame photographing, we talk about negatives or sensors that are 24 times 36 uh, millimeters. That is the full frame format and that was popularized with this camera. Uh, the inventor of the camera, Oscar Barnack, he was a film geek. So he actually loved, he loved the whole uh, moving film, moving pictures uh, industry and he also made some film cameras and as far as I know uh, I wasn't there but as far as I know he made the Leica M to test film stock for film cameras and it's also known as 35mm uh, film and the reason it's called 35mm film is because the film roll that you have in film cameras is 35mm uh, high and then you have holes so you can you can rewind the, the film uh, and what's left between uh, the 35mm and the holes is a frame that is 24mm high and then it's 36mm uh, uh, wide. And Oscar Barnack simply took uh, the film that was used in the film cameras and he rolled it into a camera body like this, a little metal body. And if you think about it, at that time all cameras were like huge boxes. So this was a new thing. And you say if you just did it to test film stock, then it uh, makes totally sense. Um, and what he did then is he discovered, wow, this can, you can actually take still photos with this small camera. It's easy to carry. Uh, nobody noticed that you just have this little camera because nobody has seen anybody with a small camera like that. And then he made a decision that instead of having uh, two frames of film uh, for moving pictures, he would put them into one. So instead of two small frames, it became one bigger frame. And then with the high quality optics, they had a lens designer that they have at the factory, the lights factory in Germany, that had him make uh, a perfect 50 millimeter that had high resolution. And by all that and making it very simple, uh, it was possible to get into the idea of small negatives, big print. So at that point, you would normally make, you'll have a negative like this size on a glass plate or a film and you'll put it into a large camera. So if you want a big picture, you had a bigger camera. And then you would go in, uh, you could say basically what you got out of the camera, that was the picture size. His idea is like, no, you have this small negative, relatively small negative. And then you also, at the same time as you make the camera, you invent a enlarger. And enlarger simply, you could say, almost the reverse. Here you have a camera that is totally black inside. You press the shutter and then light comes in and hit the film. You develop the film, then now you go in the dark room and you put the negative into a negative hole under the optics and there's light behind the negative. So now you have a big dark room and you have light coming through the film and through the optics and it 
goes down on light sensitive paper and then you develop that in chemicals. So that was the principle and one of the things that was established uh, already then, just because that was how uh, Oscar Barnack and the lights factory looked at things, is like things have to be very high quality, uh, it has to be persistent mechanics, persistent optics, and it has to be simple. And that is how uh, we got the Lager M. That was the bird of the Lager M. And you can say not much have actually changed in the form factor, the size, or uh, the way it's built of uh, brass and heavy metal uh, in the last 100 years. The only thing that has changed is that we have now, uh, since 2006, we have replaced, or Leica have replaced, uh, the film plane with a digital sensor. And in 2009, that sensor became full frame. Before that, it was a crop factor because they couldn't make it that big. Um, fundamentally, the Leica M through 100 years is the same, uh, with a few uh, changes and new features. And you could say also what have happened in the last 100 years is that uh, the precision grinding of lenses, the precision assembling, how precise you can you can work with metals and uh, mechanics uh, for these cameras have been optimized. So now it's even more precise and that is befitting because with digital sensors you go from a film plane that is fairly precise but not 100% precise, you go to a glass plate sensor that is always sitting very precise in the camera so now you suddenly see every little detail and every little misalignment in focus you see uh, so you could say that the, the main difference is it's just become more uh, precision. The Leica M was a huge success uh, because it was so simple and it was portable. It was a camera that was adopted by men, women, children, everybody. So now you didn't suddenly you didn't have to have like some technical uh, knowledge to actually take pictures, and you didn't have to to carry a lot of expensive stuff, you would just have a fairly uh, small camera. So you could say, uh, this was paradise. Uh, I usually point out as one interesting detail, if you go back and look 1925 and the following years, you will see there was a lot of female photographers that picked up the Leica and started making really interesting photographs. Uh, so if you think that uh, photography have always been for men and blah, 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 that is not true. The Leica was a camera that back then and still uh, is a camera that attracts women or women attracts the camera, I don't know, uh, but that's just an interesting little fact. So here you have this perfect camera, it's doing really well, it's selling uh, worldwide, uh, but of course uh, there's always a snake in the paradise and in this case it was that uh, a lot of people copied this camera, so you go back and look at Canon, Nikon, a lot of the different brands and also uh, Russian uh, copies of the Leica that would even say Leica came out. So everybody's like, everybody, of course, people, photographers, people saw, wow, this is a great camera, this is a great idea. And of course, other uh, companies saw this is a great idea, let's do <laughs> exactly the same. So some did exactly the same, some did other versions, and then some tried to improve it. And you would say one of the uh, old school things about the Leica M and also the weakness of it maybe is that the way that you uh, focus it is, it is manual focus and everything, uh, very simple and nice if you like that. But one of the things is that you look for a rangefinder here. So when I focus, I have to look for here manual focus and there's a focus mechanism in here that goes, uh, actually I look for this one, but there's a little eye here that aligns the distance so I can focus it. Um, and you search create, it's actually a miracle that you can even make a camera that is so uh, precise that you can set a distance four meters away and it's like spot on. That's a miracle. Nevertheless, uh, different ideas come up and one of them was uh, what if we put in a, a prism here and a mirror. So instead of looking through this one, you actually look through the lens, you see exactly where is my focus and you see what is the frame exactly and everything. And that uh, evolved, so we got uh, the so-called SLR cameras, that's single lens reflex cameras. Before that, there was a few, there was a period also where there was cameras with like two lenses. So 
one lens on top of the other, or like uh, two lenses on the camera body, so you look through one of them to focus and everything, and the other one was mirrored, and then that one took the photo in on the film. Uh, sort of great idea, but kind of like double of what you needed. So then came a single lens reflex. And single lens reflex became really uh, popular, and uh, the sale of the Leica M went down. And the answer to that from Leica's side was that, oh, we're going to make also an SLR. And this is this one. Uh, this is in the 1960s that Leica made this one. And the way it works is now you have uh, inside here you have a mirror. So when I look through this one, uh, I see we have a prism here that reflects down here, and I see for the lens. And when I take the picture, then the mirror goes up, and the picture goes into the film. Uh, this one is called Leica Flex SL, uh, and that is a really uh, beautiful camera in many ways. And it's built; it's probably a Leica SLR camera that has the most feel like this full metal like an M. Uh, it's really uh, solid and the sound of the shutter here is amazing. I'll just take it again just for fun of it. That is how it sounds. Uh, beautiful camera. Uh, like I was a little bit late uh, with these cameras. Um, so you could say Canon, Nikon, everybody else uh, kind of went in on the market they had. And, uh, but you say Leica still kept making the Leica M, they also kept making uh, SL cameras and modernized them and then worked for a period up till uh, in the beginning of the 80s, they worked with uh, Minolta because Minolta knew a lot about electronics and those technical things and Leica knew a lot about uh, mechanical things and optics. So they kind of merged and made several models where it came out both as a Minolta camera and as a Leica camera. Then you could say, kind of like in the 90s, we start to have the first uh, digital cameras. You would see like you would have a Nikon professional camera with one megapixel. And it was a deadly expensive camera, uh, but it was great if you were working on a newspaper or a magazine that, for example, you go photograph uh, a football match uh, on a Sunday and the, the f and, and you what you would do is like you would make the photo digital and you could actually already then in the 90s you could transfer it uh, via the telephone <laughs> back to the newspaper so they could get the picture into the newspaper before the deadline so next morning when the newspaper came out it had a picture from the fight. Uh, before digital you would have to photograph the mass on film then you would have to drive back to the dark room, develop the film, make some prints, scan those prints and put them in a newspaper. So suddenly you saved uh, several hours and often with a newspaper coming out once a day, you saved one day. Uh, so that was uh, popular and that was, you could say, everything in photograph that have increased the speed have always been popular. Uh, <clears throat> so you could say with the SLR camera came also uh, film uh, motors. So you could hold the button down and it would take uh, two pictures a second or then it would be five pictures a second and then seven pictures a second. And we also got out of focus with the idea that now you can take photos uh, faster. So everything and, and many other things, but everything in photography that seems to make it better and faster have always been the way to take a bigger market here. And you could say for a long time uh, Nikon and Canon have been lying up and down. So kind of then Canon went up uh, and then Nikon came with a faster autofocus than all the newspaper. Fortunately sold the, or traded in the Canon and got the Nikon instead. And then a few years later it was the other way around. They traded in the Canon and I got whatever. So that's uh, <laughs> the short story of uh, photography and uh, Leica came out with the first digital M in 2006. Um, <clears throat> at the same time they also had uh, the SLR camera, the single lens reflect camera that was film based and then they made a digital back. I've done a whole one hour long video just about that camera where you simply take a film camera and you put on a digital back. You can take it off and put back the film back again and so on. Amazing camera. Uh, but I came out with that camera in 2004 with a crop uh, sensor. Uh, beautiful camera, beautiful everything. 
but I was kind of like his introduction into uh, digital. Um, the camera was great, but it didn't go that well for different reasons that I will not go into today. Uh, but what did happen was that Leica said, okay, we're going to stop doing the so-called Leica R system, that's the SR system, and we'll just focus on the M system in digital and other uh, smaller cameras, and also we'll make a medium format, S format uh, camera that would kind of compete with Hasselblad, also a digital camera, of course. Uh, and then the R system was dead for a while. But then suddenly in 2015, like I said, now we're going to make the Leica SL. And Leica SL is fundamentally, uh, in many ways, uh, <coughs> the same as a Leica SLR, except it's a SL, so it's a single lens. It doesn't have any reflex, which means it doesn't have a mirror in here. This is the sensor you're looking at here. Um, and you could say that was quite unexpected that Leica would make uh, a camera like that uh, because at, at that time, 2015, all professional uh, photojournalists that I knew, they used to have two big SLR cameras, one with a short zoom and one with a long zoom, and then they would go to war with this stuff. Uh, and they started seeing, wow, you can get mirrorless camera, you can get a tiny little camera. Uh, so I'm not, why would I carry those two big cameras when I can just have one or two small cameras? It's much better and easier and more fun for me. Uh, so why would like it and make a, a fairly big camera uh, at that point, but there was like a really good idea behind it. Somehow like I had gotten this idea that they had a, like a S system, the medium format, but you could say uh, full frame is the new medium format. So medium format is like big negatives in the idea that you can take high resolution pictures uh, with very little grain noise on the film. But then you go into digital and you can say in a small sensor, you can see even an iPhone, then you get like 5 megapixels, then you get 10 megapixels, then you get 20. 50, 100, 150 megapixel. So, in a way, you still have the S system uh, existing, but you could say this system is basically like a small edition, a small full frame instead of medium format S camera. Uh, and one of the fundamental ideas of this camera is that uh, you have the full frame sensor in here, and then you have uh, the bayonet here. And the size of the bayonet and the distance from where the lens is to the sensor is something that lens designer Peter Karp and his team at Leica figured out. This is the exact size we need so that in the future we can make any lens. We can make fisheye, we can make 800mm tail lens, we can make zooms, we can make everything with this. And then they fall in a lot of things with uh, how do you put in uh, fast autofocus in this one. Uh, how do you put in communication between the lens and the camera and all those electronic things uh, that should be in it. And long story short, you could say this was such a great idea. Uh, you could say when I look at this camera, the first SL, this is the SL2, but if you look at the first SL, it's very similar to this one. This one has a little bit more rounded corners, which I like. Um, but you say it's basically like a metal box with a sensor. And one of the things is that you can put on any lens on it. So this, for example, is a 7 Artisan, but it does have an SL or L mount. Uh, but with an adapter, you can put any lens on. You can put uh, old Minolta lenses on, you can put Nikon lenses, Canon lenses, anything. So this basically is just a photographic box with a sensor, and then it has the usual uh, like simplicity of like three buttons here, one joystick here, uh, on and off button, and really not much more. It's not packed with buttons which is very like and something that they learned early on and they maintained is like it has to be simple don't add more than you need um, <clears throat> but this camera concept uh, became so popular that canon fuji nikon everybody <laughs> copied this and that's why you have canon r system and you have uh, nikon z as we call it in europe but it's nikon c system it's basically the same as this. I would say, uh, for example, Nikon have a bigger bayonet, and 
according to everything for no reason. It just makes everything bigger and more, you know, less handy. Whereas like it figured out, okay, we're going to have it as small as possible, but it's going to be big enough so we can do anything. What the SL system also have is that it have autofocus. Leica M is manual focus and there's not any chance I would say that it's ever going to be out of focus. It's so compact and the whole idea of it, the way it's made with the range fund is it's not going to be out of focus. Um, <clears throat> and somehow uh, the world agreed uh, many years ago that you need out of focus to take a photo. Uh, so for those who think you need out of focus to be able to take a photo, this one has out of focus. Um, but it's also, you could say, it is this metal housing of a sensor, so you can put on anything. And you say, what I often do is I put on M lenses. One of the things with uh, the SL system, which is to me a bit of a mysterium, a mystery is it became so popular despite the lenses are huge. So the L lenses that comes with for the SL system are all huge. So the 50mm is like bigger than this one, uh, like the whole camera. And, uh, and that doesn't make any sense if you like that something is compact. And you can also say it's interesting that you have all the professional photographs, they change from big uh, DSLR, digital SLR cameras with big zooms to small mirrorless cameras. And now you come out with a big camera again and then everybody goes by it and that is uh, kind of a mystery. Nevertheless, uh, that is what happened. It has one more thing here, it has an electronic viewfinder here, which is really high quality. Uh, so that's one thing Leica can do, they can do optics. And you could say the reason it sticks out this much, it has a doppler, you can adjust it for your eyesight, but the reason it sticks out here is because an electronic viewfinder, yes, that is a small screen inside the camera and you look at it via mirrors and prisms, but it's not a matter of high, how, how, how high quality is the screen. The, the, the thing is, if you hold a screen this close to your eyes, you cannot see it, so you have to have optics. So the resolution of the optics, how well the optics are made, that you don't uh, ruin your eyes and you can see clearly and you can keep looking at this small screen this close to the eye for hours every day. That is the important thing and that is what is really unique about this one. And you can see this is very similar to the one on the Leica S, which is a fantastic state-of-the-art uh, viewfinder. Um, when you have set all this, then you can say they both have a sensor inside. And you can say that M have been the same for 100 years it was film and then it became digital and you could say the first digital was 18 megapixel then it became 24 megapixel this one is 40 this one is 60 megapixel and the SL here this one the first SL was 24 megapixel and this one is 47 megapixel so the pixel will go up but the size of the sensor is exactly the same um, so in that sense you could say what you can make with this one, you can make with this one, and vice versa. Uh, so, so it's not about uh, the, quali <laughs> the quality of the sensor, uh, really. I mean, there is a quality uh, to sensors. Uh, you could say it's more important what is the optics in front of the sensor. But you could say even more important is the person behind the camera. And that is, for me, what is the big thing? Is it like an M or is it like an SL? In short, for me, it is a lifestyle choice. My preferred tool personally is uh, a like an M and preferable with a 50 millimeter like this. This one is a 50 millimeter. This one is a 50 millimeter. Uh, this one is also a 50 millimeter. It's just different types of 50 millimeter. Uh, but this kit is something I can put the strap across my chest and I can walk around with this. This is a camera I can always have with me and that is my uh, slogan and my mantra is always wear a camera and it's something I really mean that when I go out the door in the morning I take my camera with me. And to do that it requires a camera that can 
survive whatever you're doing through the day that you go in and out of cars and, and whatever you do and you put it on the table and you take it with you uh, and maybe it rains and maybe it snows um, <coughs> but this camera have it's like you say it's, a, it's, it's stylish and it's very mechanical everything sits uh, so you can it's it, you operate it almost like you use a pencil you don't think about it you don't actually have to look at the screen uh, you set up the menu once and then you forget about it the rest is just you set uh, the aperture is out here on the lens the focus is here the shutter speed is here the ISO is here and then you take pictures um, very simple and very intuitive to use and very much you can stay a lifestyle product and lifestyle product that doesn't mean like look at my camera because most people who see it they think it's your granddad's camera if they notice it uh, often it's so discreet so nobody really pays attention to it uh, but with lifestyle I mean that you always have a camera with you and you're always a photographer in the sense that you look for pictures even when you don't look for pictures and you can say my experience is uh, often when you're not when you don't take pictures you sit down and have a coffee or read a book that's when you really see some pictures and that's where you need to have the camera with you and have it ready and know how it works um, you get up to this thing you can say a lot of people put on uh, M lenses I do the same so you can put an adapter here uh, and then we can take on uh, a chunky lens like the knock looks here uh, so this is a 50 uh, 0.95 lens, uh, 50mm 0.95. So that means it's wide open here and it makes amazingly dreamy pictures. It's a very unique lens. And even if it's f 0.95, it has very precise uh, detail and sharpness uh, in the image, but it's very narrow depth of, of focus, and that is what makes it like more uh, of a fairy tale lens than a lens to make reality. And you can say maybe the whole LS system is made also with very perfect lenses to make really accurate photography and every detail in perfect. Uh, I don't feel like making perfect photographs, that's not what I do. I make something that communicates and has atmosphere and have emotions in it and you don't need, uh, you don't even need high definition but you certainly don't need uh, razor sharp details or anything like that. So anything goes, you can say this one is very popular for M lenses also because you can put them on with an adapter and you have the electronic viewfinder here so you can actually focus and see every detail. And that is one problem that people have with the M system is that they say no my eyes are not that good anymore I cannot focus. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think that you focus like this and you take the picture. It's not something you have to think about a lot and you can actually see, even if your vision is blurred, you can actually see it. Doesn't matter, you can say, whatever you feel is right is what you should do. If you feel, no, I cannot really focus this, I'm not sure about it, then why bother? Then find a way to do it. One way to do it is you put an electronic viewfinder on this one, which can also be done. So now you have an electronic viewfinder like this one and you can even swirl it so you can take photos like this or you could take them like this. Um, <clears throat> so that is, uh, you could say, one added thing that <laughs> I don't think anybody saw that one coming uh, when we talk uh, like M film cameras like 20, 30 years ago that he would ever have an electronic viewfinder. But it does have it. The SL, you could say, this is not a lifestyle camera in the sense that I walk around with it in Paris for all day or somewhere else or walk out the door in the morning so I'm just going to take my camera with me and then I put this on. Um, traditionally you would say if you put on uh, the zoom lenses for it or the SL lenses uh, it becomes really big and that usually means that the camera hangs like this uh, so that means this goes into your side here which can be pretty painful uh, or for sure you know you have a camera with you all the time and you get noticed and sometimes you walk into a restaurant or a concert venue or something that no no cameras uh, nobody hardly ever noticed this one so nobody says no cameras uh, this one have a size where people perceive this is a professional photographer or paparazzi or whoever he is um, so you can say that is the size of it then one thing I have is I look at uh, what is the result of using a camera or a lens. 
Uh, so you can have many opinions, you can read many reviews and figure out that this lens is so amazing and this sensor is so great and the resale value of this camera is great and it has uh, this and that and you can say for example one thing that like SL have it has EBIS in the sensor and EBIS is so the sensor moves so if you use a long tail lens and you have a little bit of shake from the wind or just from handshake then the sensor moves so it kind of freezes the picture so you maintain the details even at slower shutter speed and it's something people kind of like I need EBIS or when are we going to have EBIS in the M? I'm sure we're going to have it one day but we have had more than 100 years where we didn't have EBIS in cameras and we did manage to take okay photos with that uh, so it's not really a thing but you could say this is more a tech camera than this is this is more the classic it's kind of high tech <laughs> in its own way whereas this is it, this is like a new direction this is the future um, so, like other people, I have had the M for a long time, I also had SLR from Leica and everything before that. And when the SL came out, I got one and then I didn't really like it that much, but I kept it. Uh, I just didn't use it that much. Then came the SL2 and I got that one too and I didn't really use it that much. Um, and in between I had Panasonic made a sister model with Leica. Uh, so the S1R uh, and that one I used for six months before the SL2 came out so it's kind of like the SL2 with a lot more buttons and everything but kind of like the same technology and sensor inside that the SL2 would come with six months later so I used the, the Panasonic for six months uh, and I actually used it a lot for studio photos and product photos so anything when I needed something like high resolution high quality uh, F8, F11 to get full sharpness and precise color, I would take out the Panasonic. And that was something I thought about after, wow, I didn't really like the camera and I didn't use it a lot, but then again I did use it and I used it for very specific things when I wanted high quality and high resolution. Uh, the SL2 came and then I started using that for similar things, but it mainly was just sitting in a closet or in a camera bag. Then I had uh, one turning point for me with the SL was that I was in Paris and uh, in Paris at that time uh, the sun would go not down a quarter to ten in the evening. <coughs> uh, so I would go out the last two hours before sunset and take photographs. And one day the said, okay, I'm going to take uh, the SL2 and I'm going to put on an Oxlux and then I'll use that one today because it's, we're going to see what it can do. And when I came home from that two hour trip with the camera, I noticed I actually have a lot of really good photos from that. And that taught me that, I kind of knew that already, but here it really told me like no you can have a camera that you don't feel necessarily you can feel many things you can feel that you can't control it you can feel that it isn't great quality or it isn't this and that but then you look at what do I produce with it that was about what I could say about the SL and M I mean I can say much more and of course I have uh, different videos and lots of articles on my website about the different lenses, the different camera models uh, and styles of photography, so go check that out. Uh, before I end off, remember below the video there's a link to the free ebook and presets and styles, so grab them before the video ends. Uh, till I see you next time, remember to always wear a camera and thank you for watching.